So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Mark Tater today as the Bar Shop Seminar speaker. Um, Mark has been studying aging for quite a while and is, I think, really considered sort of one of the founding drosophilists to really take and apply the power of drosophila genetics to the question of aging. Um, we'll go through a little bit of his biographical sketch to give you a flavor for uh, where Mark came from. So he got a uh, MA and a PhD at the University of California, Davis, uh, one in zoology and one in ecology, two uh, degrees that I don't know how much we see of anymore, unfortunately. Everything's molecular and cellular this nowadays, at least in the Drosophila field, it seems like. And then he went and did a postdoc in genetics in the University of Minnesota, where he really started getting involved in understanding aging and the genetics underlying aging. Um, from there, he went on to his position at Brown, where he's been since 97, and he's a full professor there. Um, he's had a number of um, awards, so he's had both the Young and Senior Ellison Award, he's had an AFAR Award, and maybe the one that I think really stands out recently is he got a Merit Award from the NIA, which is uh, quite, quite a feather in the hat, so to speak. Um, he's also, of course, on many of the journals of our favorite uh, journals, uh, editor on the, many of the favorite journals that we know, so he's quite busy and interactive in the community. Uh, my, my interaction with Mark was that when I decided to do aging in my lab, someone said, well, if you're going to get a mutation that extends lifespan, you've got to get the Chico from Mark Tater's lab because that's the only one that's any good, and that's the only one that works. So that's the one I got, and it does. It works great. So I got good advice there. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark, and welcome to the seminar. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about two topics. I, I gave a, a, a title for some stuff that, we were, that I was quite excited about discussing um, that partly has been sitting around for a while, and then I'm beginning to make some sense out of it, so we want to pursue that more. But at the same time, we have some new data that I wanted to talk about, and they kind of come into two vignettes or two acts. And so this is the one that you, you think you came to hear, but I'm going to start off with talking about uh, an issue that's been um, something we've worked on for a long time in my group, and we're still kind of uh, mining a way to see what we can understand about this. And you probably are familiar with the issue from, it started with working in C. elegans as well, is trying to understand if insulin signaling regulates aging autonomously, that is by modulating aging, well, whatever that might be, in every tissue and every cell in, you know, at the site, or is there a non-autonomous regulation that insulin imposes um, and there's some sort of a secondary message that's involved in actually then transmitting the, and communicating to the rest of the, the animal, even though they all have insulin receptors, just because we've manipulated insulin in one tissue or in all tissues, it doesn't mean that that's actually what's controlling the lifespan of the fly. And then the second part of what I'm going to be talking about has to do with um, trying to understand actually what the nature is of altered insulin signaling at the level of the receptor that might lead to uh, specificity for how insulin, um, insulin IGF in Drosophila maintains pleiotropy between all the different things that it can do, growth, learning, metabolism, lifespan, reproduction, you name it. Just one receptor modulating all these traits. And then there's also this paradox of how presumably reduced insulin signaling or insulin resistance as it's characterized is actually beneficial when in mammalian systems we would say this is uh, on the way to diabetes and it's not healthy. Okay, I've got to push that a little more. So we're going to be discussing, I just want to orient you a little bit, some of the, the characters here. The Drosophila has insulin IGF-like peptides and it's a, a little better than C. elegans, where there's 40 or so. Flies have seven. Um, the adult fly pretty much expresses six of them. Uh, it's more complicated than humans, where there's 
IGF, and there's insulin. Flies, these all kind of look like insulin, but we have to deal with six or seven of them. It goes through this signaling uh, cascade that you should all be familiar with, I would think. The, the peptides, the receptor through an insulin receptor-like substrate called Chico, which we have nice mutants on. I'm glad to share these with people. These are very stable genotypes that we use that extend lifespan through AKT, negative repression on FOXO, the transcription factor. And one of the targets of, trans, of FOXO as a transcription factor is 4-ABP. This will come back a little bit later. So this is kind of old school for you, I would hope. We're going to be discussing various tissues um, in the autonomous, non-autonomous issue. We'll be discussing the receptor, FOXO transcription factor, and then our key player here is the aging fly. So I'll take you back just a little bit and set the scene. In 2004 or so, we had our FOXO overexpression paper. It was in Nature, and we presented in one of the figures that this concept, and I'm going to be trying to fill this out a little bit for you in the next uh, 20 minutes or so before I switch topics. But the basic, and I'll come back to better pictures of this that are more detailed, but let me just give you the basic overview. The insulin is produced primarily, although now we know better, but many of the insulins, DILP2, is produced in insulin-producing neurons in the brain. We discovered that the head fat body, and I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, has, when we overexpress FOXO, this manip actually causes changes in insulin production in the brain. So we think there's a feedback system here that leads to stable uh, either repression or expression of Fox of DILP2 in particular. This then gets secreted into peripheral tissues. So now we've got these different compartments, head fat body, the brain, peripheral tissues, and that we think this then leads to the autonomous control of aging through insulin signaling and peripheral tissues. So there's going to be both a non-autonomous effect here where insulin signaling modulates another hormonal pep pathway, which happens to be insulin itself. So insulin is playing both an autonomous and a non-autonomous role. And that this is how aging is regulated in Drosophila at this large endocrine level, at least. So this was the notion that we put forward in 2004. And we've been trying to understand since then what is happening in particular in the fat body tissues that leads to the communication between fat body and the central nervous system and then the control of insulin peptides from this tissue. So let's step back a little bit and look at some of the early data that led to this model. So this is a, a bit of background. Here's the head fat body in blue. There's also expressed a little bit here. These are the eyes. This is the brain. And this fat body sort of interdigitates like fingers right into the brain. I think this, is, this must be playing some very important function. But we don't, we don't really know what this fat body does. Um, probably nutritional, I would imagine. When we overexpress FOXO in these tissues, it extends the lifespan of the fly. So this is a non-autonomous effect. We're only manipulating these tissues, basically reducing insulin signaling in these tissues by, or mimicking that, by overexpressing the transcription factor that would be normally activated when insulin signaling is reduced. And we get a whole animal phenotype, which is increased lifespan. Now we're doing this with a RU46 um, con um, conditional expression system that's also tissue specific. So these are just adult manipulations, and all the genotypes are identical. It's just a matter of do they have the drug to turn on the transgene or not, and we find a nice dose response and lifespan when we activate FOXO in that case. Can I ask you one thing? Pardon? Can I ask you one thing? Yes. So did uh, this, um, this fat body, does it control the temperature, like as a thermostat? To, um, I don't think so. Uh, flies are poikilothermic, and they can regulate their temperature behaviorally. And in this environment, they're in a constant 25 degree environment. So I don't think if it had any effect, if it could have an effect on behavior, there's no opportunity for that to be activated here. Okay. So the thing that, that, that was most interesting that was sort of our big clue was Meng, uh, who was doing this at the time? I think it was Meng Ping, who's now uh, teaching at, at Bard High School. But 
which is quite good at teaching, was she noticed that the fat bodies down in the abdomen, far away from where we were doing the manipulation, showed when we induced FOXO in the head, there were changes in lipid droplets in the abdominal fat body compared to the control, which didn't have the RU. And then when we looked at the FOXO localization in these tissues, again, this is in the abdomen, at a distance from where we actually did the overexpression, we could see FOXO here is the, um, is the red. It's in the cytoplasm, means it's unphosphorylated. And uh, then it becomes, um, no, this is phosphorylated cytoplasmic. And then, and the, then it goes into the nucleus, which is why these dots, dots are much bigger, which suggests that these peripheral tissues are perceiving an environment of reduced insulin signaling. So we forced reduced insulin signaling in head fat body, but we're seeing evidence of reduced insulin signaling at a distance. So this was puzzling because we weren't doing the manipulations in those tissues. We were manipulating the head fat body. So we went to look at the neuroendocrine cells in the head that produce insulin. This is their using an insulin, a human insulin um, antibody to highlight what these cells are. And we did PCR and found that in the controls, that's normalized here to one, that when we induce head fat body, FOXO, we end up reducing one of the three insulins that are produced in these cells. Actually, there's four, but DILP1 is, is very rare and hard to measure. So DILP2 is going down. DILP3 and DILP5 are unaffected. So the notion then, just stepping back a little bit, is that when we and you can see this is that diagram I showed you before. Overexpressing FOXO in these tissues here, we think, leads to communication that suppresses DILP2 in the brain. And we would hypothesize then there's reduced DILP2 being secreted out into the hemolymph of the blood of the fly, which then would reduce the insulin signaling of peripheral tissues. And this is what causes the met metabolism phenotype that we noticed. At the same time, we would think that this Reduced DILP2 would then lead to less insulin signaling here, and that would release the repression of FOXO. This would be more activated, so this becomes a reinforcing network on this side, non-autonomously, that then controls the quantity of DILP2 that will be then secreted out into the hemolymph. So this looks good, but what it's really only doing, uh, we get an aging phenotype, but it's really what we can see in this peripheral tissue is we can only measure the metabolic phenotype. And there might be, actually, that the brain is controlling some other hormones, that this is responsible for the aging phenotype itself. What? Yes? So is, are the DILPs released at synapses only, or do they have some kind of, is there some kind of neuroendocrine, uh, or endocrine type Stop. of way that they could be? It turns out it's both. They are secreted all, I, don't, I might have a picture of this a little later. They're secreted all along the axon through the brain, you can see vesicles of the insulin being secreted with confocal microscopy and 3D reconstruction into the brain. Then it comes down all the way to um, the end of the axon. It innervates uh, endocrine tissue called the corpocodiaca, which seems to store quite a bit of insulin while it's at it, then, but continues down right to the, the area that's the fly heart. And there it secretes the insulin in abundance into the hemolymph near the heart, and then it gets pumped throughout the entire, entire animal. So it's, it's like everywhere, and it has lots of ways of getting, getting it out into the system. So the question for us, and this is one that you know, we struggle with all the time, is, well, okay, so insulin signaling, reduced insulin signaling extends lifespan, but is this because it's autonomous, the tissues autonomously are slowing their aging in the process of experiencing reduced insulin. To address this, um, it was a fortuitous meeting when I met um, Rolf Bodmer or his group at the University of Michigan. And they were studying the fly heart at the time. And they were noticing that um, as a function of age, if you stimulate the fly heart, like on a tread fly treadmill that they do with, with electrical stimulation, the failure rate increases with age. 
and fly hearts. So this is an autonomous aging behavior or functional aging in the fly. And I proposed what we should take a look at was how does insulin signaling affect this? And if we then take our Chico mutants, I think that's what this one is. We did this like three or four different ways, reducing insulin signaling systemically. Here's the wild type increase in failure rate. And this particular manipulation, I can't quite recall what it is. They start off a little worse when they're young, but there's very little age increase. So the systemic increase, uh, systemic reduction of insulin preserves the, the autonomous aging of the fly heart. But we don't know, again, if this is because it's the in reduced insulin at the heart or something else. The solution to this comes with uh, a driver that is specific to the heart muscles. And what we could do there is um, express FOXO or express a insulin receptor dominant negative right in those tissues, leaving the rest of the animal wild type. And we get the same phenotype. Here's the controls. There's a big increase in insulin, a uh, big increase in heart failure rate. And here there's a very little increase in heart failure rate, meaning that there's been an autonomous modulation of the aging process. So we can then make the inference, we go downstream of this, that this reduced insulin signaling, we presume from reduced DILP secretion into the hemolymph, actually is reducing the autonomous effects of insulin. So it's both playing an autonomous and non-autonomous role in the control of aging. So that's backfill. An important thing that we had to sort out in the meantime, because um, was in our overexpression studies in the head fat body, we had seen uh, a nice increase in lifespan. The way we had done these experiments originally is we'd put the RU46 in uh, yeast paste so this is like ad libitum feeding galore for a fly. They love this stuff. We didn't have a way to control the dose of the RU46, and we didn't have a way to control how much they were eating. So what we decided to do was to switch and to put the RU46 in the basal media and that they normally feed on, where we can then control the amount of yeast in the food so we can then look across different yeast concentrations. And this is a typical dietary restriction response. This is the median lifespan. And these are the control flies without RU. And you can see lifespan is greater in the flies if they're on a low yeast diet than on a high yeast diet. And this is typically how we do it in our lab. We leave sugar constant. We manipulate yeast levels. It works very nicely. If we increase FOXO in the head fat body, we find, uh, sorry, this is the wild type here, uh, the controls. These are the. FOXO induced, there's an increase in lifespan under high diets, but not under low diets. Okay? And this might be why originally when Linda Partridge tried using the same driver as we did, her food actually was done in this range. And they, she said, oh, I, I don't see an effect of overexpressing FOXO using this driver. Um, and we said, yep, this is probably because it works on their, on their rich diets, which they didn't test originally, but not under these kinds of diets. On the other hand, Mark, which yes. which do you think is more common in fly guys? For fly guys? Well, whatever your lab. I mean labs? Yeah. <laughs> the the standard Caltech diet, which is, you know, right. is typically down in in this range of two to four percent. But I got to caution you that with that. What t people typically do is you grow the fly larvae on that kind of food, but if you want the adults to lay eggs, then you sprinkle live yeast on top of it, which is an uncontrolled amount of food. So, and in Partridge's lab, um, they use this different kind of diet that doesn't have cornmeal in it, da da da. Even with a, one of their rich diets, which is like 1.5 or something, they will not lay eggs on it because there's actually very little yeast on the surface. They have to add yeast to get the flies to lay eggs. So the the flies are all reared under these conditions where you add yeast, um, but then they do the diet restriction experiments without it. Yeah, it's, it's a mess. So there's another fat depot in the fly, the abdominal fat. I showed you some data from that before. And we, before, we didn't find much of an effect of overexpressing FOXO in these depots on lifespan. But we tried the same experiment now where we use different levels of dietary yeast 
And now we get a, a small but real increase in lifespan going from the wild type here to overexpression. But it's mostly seen very strongly on, on a restricted diet. So what this is saying is that these different FOXO in different tissues is diet sensitive to when it will extend lifespan. And I can't explain why this happens. It's just a phenomenon that's going to come back in the data I'm about to show you when we start messing around with the signaling that's happening between the, the, the fat body and the brain. So here's the question that's new for us. These are new data from my postdoc, Kwabe. And this is how does the fat body communicate with the insulin producing cells of the brain to control aging? I can't answer this, but we have a new piece to the puzzle that's quite exciting. And that is, there's another insulin in flies that we've been ignoring up to this point. It's called DILP6. DILP6 is not produced, well, it turns out it is produced a bit in the brain, but it's not produced in those insulin producing cells that I showed you. DILP6 actually has had very recently a good run in the theater in a, in a child acting role because it's been found by a number of groups to play uh, roles in the fat body of larvae. And it has to do with um, uh, metabolism as the larvae enter into uh, pupation and supporting metabolism during metamorphosis. So we wanted to know, seeing these, these, these papers and talking with them, this is completely cool. What about DILP6 in the adult? And we had to ask, well, if it's in the larval fat body, what about the adult fat body, which, by the way, is a completely different tissue. The larval fat body undergoes histolysis at, at uh, metamorphosis, and the adult fat body comes from new progenitor cells and repopulates the, the fly. So we investigated where the different DILPs were in different tissues, whole body, fat body, mid-gut, ovary. This is the brain by itself, and this is the head carcass, which is going to end up being the fat body that's connected to the exoskeleton of the fly. And DILP6 is predominantly in the adult fat body. Uh, it's probably some of this is because it's in the head fat body, but it also there's some of it in the brain, but just not in the usual cells. And then DILP1, 2, 3, and 5, you see, are predominantly or exclusively in the brain. 3 is a little bit in the midgut. So these we know are in the insulin-producing cells, and you don't see these at all in the fat body. So the location of, of DILP6 in the adult is We'll focus on the fat bodies for now. And we can show that DILP6 is regulated by FOXO. So if we overexpress FOXO in abdominal fat body or in head fat body, then we get an increase in the um, level of mRNA of DILP6. So overexpress FOXO in the head fat body, DILP6 in the head fat body goes up, abdominal fat body and DILP6 goes up in the abdominal fat body. And then we ask the question, if DILP6 is downstream of FOXO, and we know that FOXO overexpression extends lifespan, uh, is DILP6 overexpression sufficient to extend lifespan? Is it potentially an intermediary between FOXO and the IPCs and in the control of systemic aging? What I'm showing you here is for abdominal fat body, where FOXO overexpression increases lifespan on low yeast diets. And what we see now is that overexpressing DILP6 on low yeast diets extends lifespan. So here's without RU and here's with RU. If we do this on a high yeast diet, it recapitulates what I just showed you about the diet dependence. There's no benefit to overexpressing DILP6 from this particular tissue. We get the same idea, but the converse results with expressing in the head fat body. It extends lifespan on a high yeast diet, but not on a low yeast diet. So these recapitulate the patterns that we saw of diet dependence regulation of lifespan from FOXO, suggesting that DILP6 is downstream of that pathway. When we look in the tissues where we overexpress DILP6, we see increased insulin signaling as you might expect. But it, it indicates that the DILP6 is an agonist in that tissue. So by, by, by the increased insulin signaling, what I mean is you can see a repression of 4-ABP, which is regulated by the transcription factor FOXO. But if you look elsewhere outside the tissue where you were doing the manipulation, 4-ABP goes up. 
So this is uh, abdominal fat body, UAS DILP6. So we're overexpressing DILP6 in abdominal fat body. And when we look in the thorax, we don't see increased insulin signaling. We see decreased insulin signaling. 4-ABP goes up because FOXO is activated. That means there's less insulin signaling. And this, this is predominantly flight muscle. We don't see much of an effect in head. It's significant. The magnitude is small. This is impressive. Look in the brain. So we're expressing DILP6 in abdominal fat body. And now the brain is showing reduced DILP2 mRNA and reduced DILP5 mRNA. Before, when we just overexpressed FOXO, we just found reduced, eh, is this true? Just DILP2 mRNA, or maybe it's 2 and 5. But DILP2 is what we found. Um, yeah, FOXO reduces just DILP2. And here's new data for us is important. Just we've, up until this point, we've just been looking at uh, mRNA in the insulin-producing cells. But that really doesn't tell us about the secretion, the protein production or secretion of the DILPs. And it's because it's been very difficult to actually measure circulating insulin in an adult fly. And how are you going to get the blood out of an adult fly? How much are you going to get? Do you have antibodies that are specific to the different DILPs? And do we have peptides that we, for the different DILPs that we can use to prove that the antibodies that we have are specific and just measuring the DILPs that we're targeting and not measuring something else? And at this point, we've solved all those technical questions. And what we can show you now is that the, these manipulations actually reduce the circulating DILP2 in the hemolymph. Uh, Here's wild-type flies that are fed. Here's wild-type flies that are starved. This strongly reduces DILP2 in the hemolymph, as you might expect. But the nice thing is now, overexpression of FOXO in the abdominal fat body reduces DILP2 that's being secreted into the hemolymph. So to wrap up this idea and this part of the talk, what we can see now is that there's an insulin regulatory circuit and a systemic signal circuit. And in the Regulatory circuit, from the fat body, FOXO is regulating DILP6. FOXO might have its own effects through other pathways we haven't discovered yet, affecting DILP2 and perhaps DILP5 in the brain. DILP6, though, is sufficient to regulate DILP2 and DILP5 in the brain. And we think what this does, then, is it reduces the, we can show now, the amount of DILP2 that's secreted from these neurons is reduced. And that should be, then, sufficient to modulate the autonomous, insulin-dependent aging profiles of specific tissues. One of the other aspects of this is that we know from other work, some work that I've done with Quan Yu on short neuropeptide F, which is, by the way, a homolog of mammalian NPY, and by Dirk Bowman and Heinrich um, Jasper's work on junk, is that these also impinge on DILP2 message, at least, in the brain. And so what this potentially gives us are uh, feedback systems and stress sensitivity systems that can trigger or repress insulin production in these neurons. And then this circuit here becomes a positive reinforcing circuit. In the presence of DILP2, this will reinforce itself by repressing FOXO, which releases this repressor, so this stays on. But if one of these triggers perhaps causes a reduction in DILP2, this gets inactivated. FOXO then represses DILP2, and it will be maintained in a turned off state. And the way I look at this is that this regulatory circuit provides a way for the insulin signaling that becomes systemic to exist in two stable alternative uh, landscapes. One, which is there's low insulin signaling, and it's not going to fluctuate much because it's reinforced to be off. The other is high insulin signaling, where it's not going to fluctuate much because it's going to be reinforced to be on. But there is different types of triggers that then can move that ball from one valley to the other valley, moving the animal perhaps, let's say, from a pro-reproductive, pro-aging state to a state of longevity assurance and diapause or quiescence with low reproduction. And the consequence of this regulatory circuit then is lower insulin circulation and therefore slow aging or rapid reproduction and concomitantly rapid aging. OK, and we'll come back to DILP5 here briefly. So 
if there's five, six, seven insulins, and they can do all these different magic things in the fly, uh, how can, through one receptor, as this is the only one we're aware of, different insulins, one receptor, multiple phenotypes. So how does the receptor parse out, identify, recognize, interact with different insulins to both give you know, growth effects, metabolism effects, and aging effects? And one answer might be through binding proteins, but there's just not much known about them yet. Ah, so here's that, here's that image I was telling you about. This is the top of the uh, body of the neuron. This is the long axon. This comes out towards the corpora chidiaca. This is blown up here, and you can see actually the vesicles being secreted off into the brain. It's, it's quite a nice image. This is made by one of my grad students. And then the insulin gets secreted out into, into the hemolymph. So we, we know from a, a wide range of data now that reducing insulin signaling increases lifespan, right? Our work originally with receptor mutants, with the IRS mutants, Chico, um, a number of groups have ablated these cells. Uh, we did this. Partridge's group has done this several times. Other people as well, this extends lifespan. And I'll show you quite a bit of data on this now. Most recently, we've been, and others, have been reducing the insulin-like peptides using um, uh, RNAi, or actually uh, uh, from... Uh, Max Planck, they've done it by homologous recombination. It's quite nice. These all produce long-lived flies. So when we talk to, especially you know, people in the biomedical research um, realm that work in humans, and, and or it just the way it comes out in the literature, we characterize this as reduced insulin IGF signaling. Uh, this is often then people think this is insulin resistance. Because, you know, after all, we have a mutant insulin receptor, so these cells must be insulin resistant. And it's this paradox then, because, you know, how can we, um, yeah. these flies should be sick. You know, humans with insulin resistance are not very healthy. This leads to, you know, it's part of the syndrome of diabetes. So the issues, I think, you know, and, and, and and so they look at the fly and the worm models, and they say there's something wrong here. You know, we don't think this is actually relevant necessarily to humans, but there's absolutely there's something fishy, there's paradoxical. And the, the two issues I want to raise with you is, uh, or are, is are we talking about, um, even though we have an insulin receptor in these seven insulin-like peptides, are these insulins or IGFs? That makes a difference. Uh, and also, what's actually the evidence that these cells are insulin resistant? We just know that we've made a mutation, but are they, you know, can we measure their sensitivity? We can't do a clamp assay to look at the efficiency of their responses when we control insulin levels or, sh or sugar levels. So the issue becomes, what's the nature of the altered insulin IGF-like signaling that contributes to longevity assurance? Is it just the qu quantity, you know, is resistant, there's less, or is there actually a change in the quality? that actually these mutations have all led to a difference in, in, in how the insulin signaling works, and yet they're, they're very sensitive. We've just changed the quality and the pleiotropy of the system. Yes? I think the only way is that uh, discussion, if they reduce the insulin action, they extend the lifespan in the mammals or not. But the Dr. Kahn's group showed that the, the fact of the insulin receptor knockout mice in the fat tissue they extend the lifespan. And do you think that's the part of the support your the, the observation? There's some tissue that maybe some tissue specific the 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 knockout of the insulin receptor could be the the relevant to the the Yeah, it could be tissue specificity. But also with the Furco mice, they had the the adipose that they had as adults was very different than a normal adipose. And so that experiment does not tease out changes, you know, in development that might lead to sort of a retention of a juvenileized tissue from actually the insulin function within those tissues. Yeah, They're kind of it's it's hard. one reason I like using the gene switch system in flies is we get normal development and then we do the manipulation just in the adult to avoid these very problems. Okay, so here's a, a, a slide that summarizes a lot of data from different labs. 
what I'm going to argue from this is that it's the quality of the insulin signaling that modulates aging and not the quantity. It's not just resistance. It's actually which insulin peptide plays the role and perhaps then how the receptor perceives them. So what I'm showing you here are the are five dopes that come out of the brain. Uh, blue means that the manipulation that I'm showing you here has reduced the message of this DILP, and red means that it's been increased. These are the uh, first authors of papers where this has been reported. And then here's, for instance, our first work. Fat body overexpression of FOXO, reduced DILP2, didn't change three or five. Um, ablate the medial secretory neurons, it knocks everybody out. The, all of these extend lifespan, all these manipulations. Um, DILP3 RNAi, we did this with uh, uh, K.J. Min and Quan Yu. So we're knocking down DILP3, but for some reason, this leads to a knockdown in DILP2 and DILP5. These flies are long lived. DILP2 homologous recombination. This is Gronke from Partridge's group. This knocks down 2. That was the target, but paradoxically, it leads to an increase in 3 and 5. This extends lifespan. Uh, this is from... Um, the uh, Heinrich Jaspers group with uh, Dirk Bowman, the Puck mutant reduced DILP2. DILP3 was unchanged. This extends lifespan, and this is work with Quan Yu that I've done, short NPF. This is the NPY homolog. Um, this reduces 1 and 2 when we overexpress the, uh, when we knock these, the system down. This regulates insulin production in the IPCs. This extends lifespan. The thing that's common to all these manipulations is that DILP2 is reduced in every case. But what happens to the other insulins? Well, either they're unmeasured, they're unchanged, or they even go up. This argues to me that there's something unique about DILP2 and not DILP5, for instance, that's playing a role in aging. It's the quality of the DILP2 peptide that matters, and reducing that extends lifespan. The, the point I'm trying to make here, and this is the end of Quan's, you know, little bits and pieces of unpublished data, is that it's the combined quality of the insulin-like peptides that appear to be regulating the outcomes phenotypically. It's not just that these flies are insulin resistant. They're actually experiencing and processing insulin ligands in different ways. The last bit that I'm going to focus on as I close up is some work. This is like really old stuff. I started way at the beginning with my lab as a quantitative geneticist, put it down because I couldn't understand it, but now we're coming back to it and we're going to be working with homologous recombination to recapitulate these results and then push it forward. And I think it's really fun and exciting stuff. We're also looking now at the quality of the insulin receptor. What is it about changes in the insulin receptor that lead to differences in aging and how is this different from the way the insulin receptor might regulate, say, growth or metabolism? Uh, this is something that you should be quite interested in. So what we had to work with was a series of point mutations caused by an EMS mutagenesis that was done by Manfred Fresh, you know, back in prehistory as far as I can tell. And I managed to get these flies from him before, you know, the whole system disappeared from the face of the earth. And then working with Ron Kohansky, who at the time was still a professor at Johns Hopkins University, he sequenced these. He had his own interest in them, and he gave me the data for this. So we have this allelic series. And what we did was we took this one called E19. Were they yeah? they're selected on a phenotype, or they were selected for a mutation? These were just, uh, these were just mutants and then sequenced. OK. And they, they see, pardon? They sequenced the changes. Uh, these were actually done by um, mutagenesis and then complementation over a deficiency. And when they showed lethality over a deficiency, they, they, they said, OK, we've got something there. And they just gave a num number to the allele and left it. We, we worked with these blind until we got them sequenced by Ron. And now we, I can show you actually what they're doing. So we have this allelic series. Um, and our, originally, we worked with, in our first paper, we worked with this thing called E19. We didn't actually know what it was. I could show you now. But the important thing is we did complementation testing where we took all the alleles and we complemented them against E19 and we looked for one for, uh, for uh, genotypes that would produce viable adults. Okay, A lot of these don't. They're just lethal, larval lethal, embryonic lethal. And so that's all the ones that are circled. These alleles produce viable adults when complemented 
with E19. So what we wanted to do then was to ask, how do these genotypes affect lifespan or aging? And I'm not going to go through the, the, the nuts and bolts on how this is done, but we used a quantitative genetic approach called quantitative complementation testing, which is a way to deal with variable genetic backgrounds when you've got really messy co-segregating uh, linkage disequilibria and all kinds of stuff like that. And the bottom line for this is we could query these different genotypes and ask how they affected lifespan or age-specific mortality, which is what I prefer to usually work with, relative to each other. And what we, I can plot those like this in this scale here, where if they were like the one control we had in the quantitative complementation, they're here. If they reduce mortality, that would be extend lifespan. They fall down in this range. If they increase mortality, this would be making them worse off. It's on this range. And you can see, for instance, mortality fold risk, five or six folds decrease in death rate. That's a really strong one. This one's really bad on this side. And these guys are someplace in the middle. But if you were to ask me, OK, which of these alleles slows aging? I'd say, well, OK, that looks good. I don't know. Is that one significantly different from this one? I, what is normal here? What is wild type? What is the control? To answer this question, we went out and collected wild flies from the field. Actually, Trudy McKay did this, isolated the chromosomes, and I repeated the whole process using natural variation, natural wild type alleles, and made this distribution here. So when you ask me what's wild type, I say, oh, it's this distribution of relative mortality risk centered on one. This is normal. Yes? What's the allelic variation for the rings in the wild? Uh, we don't know. This is only allelic variation at the receptor. Right. And, so, and this is not the ligand binding domain. This is kind of downstream. Well, it turns out it's all over the place. I'll show you. So this defines wild type. It's not a single value. It's a distribution. But this is fantastic. You know, you just do a t-test. Which of these falls significantly beyond two standard deviations of your wild type distribution? It's this one, this one, and this one. These guys are neutral, and that one's bad. So you can get mutations in the insulin receptor that don't affect aging, those that extend lifespan, and those that are deleterious. And we'll come back to what these are in a second. Um, yes. The other thing we could do is we measured, it turns out we measured body size while we're at it. And so Here's the wild type distribution of body size centered on one. And these are all the mutants I just showed you. They all affect body size. Only three of them extended lifespan. Some of them are neutral. But they all have IGF like phenotypes. They're all small. And there's no relationship to body size to mortality. So these have low mortality. These have high mortality. All of them have low body size. But there's no correlation here. So this nicely rules out or parses away the effects of body size from aging phenotypes through the insulin receptor. And here's the part that, you know, that you're eager for me to get to, I think. With the sequencing and now with the structural biology that's available for what the insulin receptor looks like, we can map, this is from the human receptor, we can map all those lesions that we tested right onto the receptor. And something striking falls out when you do this. The three lesions that extend lifespan all fall in the tyrosine kinase domain. None of them fall in the ligand binding domain. And E19 is right here in the fibronectin zero domain, which has never been characterized before. It hasn't even been crystallized efficiently. So our interpretation here is that this mutation, remember they were all complemented against this, leads to a change perhaps in the kinetics of the binding, but does not actually affect the, the physical contact of the ligand with the, with the binding domain. This is, these are, which one was deleterious? I can't remember. If you knock this off enough, you, do, you get shortened lifespan. So that's really bad. That just knocks out the whole function. You get normal binding, perhaps some change in the kinetics here of the binding, and then all the other benefits come by changes in the tyrosine kinase domain. And the one I'm going to focus on for the t just for now, because it's the only one I poked around with, is this one called the allele called 74. Here's the mutation. It changed it from ATC to TTC. This turns out to be an isoleucine substitute with her phenylalanine. 
And the human equivalent in the insulin receptor is at isoleucine 1157. This is known to be in the activation loop, the beta chain activation loop. And there's actually been some physical structural biology that's been done of this loop, where here's that isoleucine 1157 is right at the base of a phosphorylation site that's critical for the interaction of this activation loop with, a with the protein tyrosine phosphatase. And the notion that's put forward from this structural biology is that if this phosphorylation site is interfered with, it would actually slow the interaction of this phosphatase with the activated, autophosphorylated receptor. In other words, it would retain its phosphorylated state because it would be harder for the phosphatase to interact with this residue and remove the phosphate because of the change in this isoleucine to a phenylalanine. I mean, the, the, the structural biology paper that was making these arguments is 1999, and there's really, very, except for this kind of structural modeling, there's no evidence for this. But what we'd like to investigate now are hypotheses along these lines that actually this particular lesion is mediating the autoinhibition and is actually prolonging or increasing the sensitivity of the signaling of the receptor. It's not reducing it. It's changing its quality. And I'm going to close with a, uh, a set of models from Manfred Fresh, who's at Roche. Um, I was at an IGF meeting, and he showed this at the end of his talk. And I said, this helps me understand what's going on. Yes, yes so the paradox. That mutation, uh, that binding wire. Is that mutation? You mean this? Um, ooh. We don't know how that's affecting. So what we need to do is what, what, what the reagents we've had up to this point were this really uh, sloppy quantitative you know, EMS mutants that I don't trust the background on anymore. And we were able to do complementation testing so I can get complex phenotypes out of it. We can't do any biochemistry with them. So what our plan is now, this is we've just started doing this, is we're going back and using homologous recombination and generating these same lesions, especially the three that extend lifespan, into a common genetic background so that we then can then do the biochemistry you know, in, uh, in flies, potentially. But we might even introduce them into the mammalian insulin receptor and then do this in some mammalian cell culture. And then we can answer those questions. Okay? I'm going to leave you with this last idea from Manfred Frisch. Um, with, or, or Frederick Metzger, um, was he thinks that the difference between insulin signaling and IGF signaling in mammals is to some extent qualitative. That the insulin, it's known, the insulin pathway leads to a very rapid tonality in a, induction and then quenching of the response from the signaling pathway. The IGF pathway, partly because of these binding proteins, leads to a slow, lower tonality, but a longer signal. And he thinks that the differences, this is an interesting model, in the speed of these signals controls, therefore, the downstream phenotypes between growth, metabolism, and potentially aging. In flies, however, we have one receptor, all these ligands, and different phenotypes. And his notion is, potentially, is that these different ligands lead to or other interactions lead to different responses from the receptor. And so the receptor can have an insulin-like tonality or an IGF-like tonality. And the model that I just was putting forward to you with this notion of um, interfering with the phosphatase would actually increase and prolong the signaling of the system. And this coupled with E19, which might have you know, a, a, a little bit less induction to start with because of, of, of not the ligand binding, but the response to the ligand and the geometry, might be pushing this receptor from its sort of insulin-like behavior more along this continuum to an IGF-like behavior. So the qualitative changes could be these mutations, this one in particular, might be making the fly, it's not insulin resistant, it's at, the receptor is doing more of its IGF-like profile than it is doing its insulin metabolism-like profile. Okay. So, since you have so many substrates around there, yes. is there any competitive inhibition? 
to the what? Computative inhibition? We yeah. don't know. We have had DILP5, synthetic DILP5 peptide from, um, from Nova Nordisk, and about a month ago, we got DILP2 from a colleague in Australia. So DILP, uh, Nova Nordisk decided they don't want it to do any more work on, on Drosophila, and they, they closed the lab there. It won't basically work with us anymore, so we moved our operations to Australia. And so we're busy trying to make all of these and then study them in cell culture and do the physical chemistry and all this stuff to see exactly those kinds of questions. Hey, Mark, I'll, uh, I like the idea. Uh, can you go back a slide for me, please? Yeah. Uh, one, oh, sorry, here. You had two other mutations there. This one? And the tyrosine. Yes. Yeah, those 353 and the 211. Yes. Uh, presumably they're not tyrosine kinase dead? Because that would then argue against your hypothesis here with 74. Presumably they're not. Right. In, any evidence for that? No, we have, I haven't even tried to figure out where, what, what they're doing. Um, no evidence. Mark, along those lines, how do this line up if, if they do with the uh, um, DEF2 alleles? How does this line up to the DEF2 alleles, Pam? I was going to ask you. <laughs> Here's my, here's here's my um, recollection. Pam is the only other person so, who's ever thought about this issue. Right. So, and probably, you're probably one of 10 people that have read that 27 page genetics paper on the alleles. <laughs> but you have to help me line those up to this. That's right. So, what is, so having done uh, detailed phenotypic characterization of at least 15 phenotypes, which spans from embryonic lethality through larval um, behaviors and reproduction and adulthood. Okay. It's not clean, which is why this is kind of remarkable to me, but, but, you, but the selection was on lethality, and I think that may be why. You don't have real um, the hypomorphs, but the, the severe alleles in DAF2 frequently are in the tyrosine kinase domain. There are, in your red part, alleles there, and you're picking them up also, um, and all of these alleles of DAF2 are dour constitutive. Um, the, the null is, you never get an adult. It is lethal, which is true also. And the difference is, you're testing them as a trans heterozygote. Yes. OK, because he has to. And so we, our tests are as uh, homozygotes, right. because we can. We've also done tests with trans heterozygotes, and that information is buried, I guess, like yours, because it's you get a quantitative difference in longevity, but not in the larval phenotypes. And so that was the other thing I was going to ask you. If you see a difference in the, or more of a similarity in the larval phenotypes and a broader distribution in the adult phenotypes, because if what I'm understanding, you get uh, wider variation. So you're allowing mm. variation in the adult lifespan, and there's more of a canalization to control growth and development? We haven't looked. You know, all we have is the, this growth, you know, total body size. Right. We, uh, be really tiny. Yeah, we might have that. Really we might have the data, but I bet you we didn't measure it on a fine enough scale. You know, right. So the growth rate differences are kind of in hours over yeah, a three day period. It, you, know, you have to do it really carefully. Yeah. Right. You have to do it really carefully. So when we, when we make the, the homologous recombination series, We'll be able to actually analyze these as homozygotes because one of the issues now is there's all these second site mutations and we make them homozygous. We can't do quantitative complementation. Then we have no way of knowing what's caused by the mutant we're interested in versus second site. Um, the other thing we can do, and you know, I'm, have you I'm open to the advice, we can actually introduce mutants here. You know, it will. If you say, oh, this one we think is lethal, or this one might be interesting, we can go in and make it. Well, the reason I was asking about the ligand binding domain is because if you're changing, so have you done the mRNA of your DILPs in the 74, 211, and 353 alleles? Because if you're going to be hyperinsulinemic or, oh, those could easily be changing uh, part of these numerous feedback loops, right? There's... Uh, I, I'm so impatient to get these, these new series of flies, yeah. Uh, to do all this with quantitative complementation would, would take forever, and we'd have this 50-page genetics paper that nobody would be able to understand because it's too complicated. So we need something that's, you know, clean like, you know, surgery. 
and then we can play. Okay, I'll take more questions in a moment. Well, so do you yeah. have a Chico um, over that trumpet to answer Nick's question? Ah, uh, no, we haven't tried that. I didn't know who Nick was. Nick's question was the IRS. Yeah. So yeah. Have a enhanced or or or. I would I would I would go for that using um, I would IP the receptor and then. To a Western for the IRS. We do have epistasis now with Chico and 4ABP and FOXO, so that's underway. Okay, so this is my closing slide. The, for me, is how, how do we frame this question about parsing the roles between insulin receptor, um, IGF function, and you know, is our flies insulin resistant? And I, I think it's, we should ask less this question or worry less, is insulin resistance is good or bad for aging? I think the issue is, what's the quality of altered insulin IGF signaling that specifies longevity assurance? And that's why I ran through all these different cases trying to make the argument that it's, it's, it's the quality of what's happening and not necessarily the quantity. And that we get slow aging when we have a functional receptor, potentially one that's very sensitive but it has altered activity. We don't know what those activities are, but we think this is where we should be going. And so the work that I've shown you today, uh, currently I'm working with uh, Huabei, uh, King Ping, Rochelle Yamamoto, my lab. The FOXO work on different diets was done by KJ Min. Um, Kwan Yu, my colleague in Korea, provided all those strange but tantalizing data that I described to you, and also we worked together on the, the NPF project and the Ralph Bodmer I've been collaborating with for quite a while on functional aging. These are the producers, you know, the producers are the people that provide the money for your plays, okay? And she's telling this guy, scientists have extended the life of the fruit fly. He couldn't care less, but he should. Okay, I hope there's time for more questions. Thank you.